Hi guys, it's me, Professor D. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering therapeutic relationships. Um, this is a pretty short chapter, so it won't take long, but there are a lot of important concepts you have to understand about therapeutic relationships and therapeutic communication. And if you can understand these fundamental principles, when you get a test question, you may not even know the answer, but because you know the the, the principles of therapeutic communication and relationships, you'll be able to eliminate some wrong answer choices and you might even be able to pick out your answer choice even if you don't know what the answer should have been. So let's get started. The first thing I wanna to bring to your attention, let's talk about therapeutic relationships. Right here, so it says, in a therapeutic relationship, the nurse maximizes communication skills, understanding of human behaviors and personal strengths to enhance the patient's growth. Uh, therapeutic communication, guys, it's always about the patient. It's about getting them to um, talk about their feelings, to express their concerns and, and the anxiety, anything that you know they're concerned about. But it's always about them. It's not about you, okay? Patients more uh, easily engage in re relationship when the clinician's interactions address their concerns, the patient's concerns, not yours, their concerns, respect patients as partners in decision-making and use straightforward language. Um, we don't use medical jargon or lingo in therapeutic communication. We have to be able to communicate with the patient in a way that they understand and they don't feel um, inferior to you because you're using big words that they don't understand. These interactions are evidence that the focus of the relationship is on who, look at what it says, guys, is on the patient's ideas, experiences, and feelings. It's all about the patient. Whenever you get a test question, they're asking you about, you know, what you, what's your response going to be? Don't ever choose the response where you make it about yourself. I would do this, or I think that. No, it's not about you. It's about the patient. And I drew a little arrow over here. Let's see what it says. So for example, the patient says, oh, I just hate to be alone. It's getting me down. And sometimes it hurts so much. Instead of saying, are you sad? Where that's a closed ended question. The patient just would answer yes or no. And it really doesn't provide them an opportunity to express themselves. You use an open ended question. You say, you say loneliness can be painful. You start off by that. The reason you're doing that, you're acknowledging how they're feeling. You're letting them know, you hear what they're saying, okay? So you acknowledge what they say. Loneliness can be painful and look how you follow it up. What is going on now that you're feeling so alone? And that provides them with an opportunity to express themselves because number one, they feel like they're being heard. They feel like they're being understood. And number two, they were given an opportunity to express themselves in a non-judgmental manner. So let's talk about blurring of boundaries and boundaries, especially you guys are going to learn this uh, when you get into psych nursing for sure. You have to establish healthy boundaries. Boundaries are always at risk for becoming blurred. Two common circumstances in which ba uh, boundaries are blurred are one, when the relationship slips into a social context. Let's stop right there. So you are caring for this person, for this patient, but now all of a sudden, it turns into, it turns from a healthcare to something more social where you're inviting them out for drinks or to your house for dinner, okay? So one, when it slips into social context or you talk about personal things that you shouldn't be talking about or two, when the nurses need for attention, affection and emotional support are met at the expense of the patient's needs. So number one, where it turns into something that's social or number two, the nurse is the one that's getting their needs met. They wanna feel needed or love or, or you know, respected, whatever it is, it's the nurse's needs that's being met and not the patient's needs. Blurring of roles. These are very important uh, definitions to know and you have to understand them. They do show up on NCLEX, so you have to know the difference between them, guys. So let's talk about transfers. Transference occurs when the patient unconsciously and inappropriately displaces or transfers onto the nurse feelings and behaviors related to significant figures in the patient's past. So for example, you might get a patient that absolutely hates your guts. They know nothing about you. All you did was walk into the room to introduce yourself and they hate you, but they don't really hate you. You look like the ex-husband or the ex-wife that cheated on them. You look like somebody who really hurt them in the past. And so all of those 
feelings of anger, hatred that they had for that person in the past, they're transferring it onto you. Now, transfers can be also good feelings. You just came to introduce yourself. Patient knows nothing about you, but they love you to death. They're already ready to email corporate and tell corporate what a wonderful nurse you are. And you just started the shift. Do they really love you? No, they don't know you. You remind them of their daughter that died 20 years ago. You remind them of somebody that was kind to them in the past, okay? So that's what transfers is. When the patient transfers feelings from someone else, positive or negative, doesn't matter, onto you. That's transference, okay? Now, let's look at counter-transference. Counter-transference. This um, is uh, transference in reverse. It occurs when the nurse unconsciously displaces feelings related to significant figures in the nurse's past onto the patient. You don't know that patient, but you can't stand that patient. That patient reminds you of somebody that robbed you years ago and never gave you your money back. Or you absolutely love that patient to death because that patient reminds you of your father or your grandfather, okay? So transference is the feelings from the patient to the nurse counter transference is feelings from the nurse to the patient whether those feelings are positive or negative i'm going to scroll up a little bit because i skipped something but i did on purpose because i wanted you guys to see the difference between transference and counter transference first look here it says nurses physicians and social workers all are potential objects of transference this transference can be positive or negative. So I explained that to you already. If a patient's motivated to work with you, completes assignments between sessions, and shares feelings openly, it's likely that the patient is experiencing positive transference. You know, um, you give them good feelings, good vibes. Positive transfer transference does not need to be addressed with the patient. However, look at this, guys. The nurse may need to explore negative transference that threatens a nurse-patient relationship. So if the patient absolutely hates their gut, they're refusing to ambulate when they're supposed to. They're refusing to do their leg exercises or their breathing treatments. Just because they don't like you, that may need to be explored because that patient may need to realize, you know, you're David or you're Bob or you're Kimberly, and you are not that person that they hate so that they're willing to get better and do what they need to do to get better, all right? Common forms of transference include the desire for affection or respect and the gratification of dependency needs. Other transferential feelings are hostility, jealousy, competitiveness, and love. All of these are feelings that the patient or the nurse can feel for each other. Before I go to the next page, I want you guys to take a look at uh, this table. By the way, if you haven't watched my video already on test taking strategies and studying, make sure you watch that. It's in my NCLEX playlist. But if you're a student right now and you wanna make your life a lot easier, let me tell you something. These tables and diagrams and figures and charts and, and graphs that you skip over when you're reading your book and you're studying, where do you think most of your test questions are coming from? Yeah, I want you to think about it. Why would the author take time to put something in text? And the same thing that they're putting in text, they take that same time to put that same information in a table or a box or a diagram or a figure or a chart or whatever it is. They're giving you that same information, but they're displaying it in a different way because it's so important because you're going to see it on test somewhere. So they want to make sure that you get it. So stop skipping over these guys. These are where your test questions are coming from. So let's look at this table. It says patient and nurse behaviors that reflect blurred boundaries. So let's look at this. When the nurse is overly involved, so for example, they cause increased dependency on the nurse. You're doing things to make the patient more dependent on you. The whole goal is to make the patient independent. We want the patient to do as much for themselves as possible. We don't want them dependent on us. But when you start to blur those lines, you want that patient dependent on you so you can feel important, so you can feel like you're helping, okay? Inability of the patient to perform tasks which he or she is known to be capable of prior before the nurse's help, which causes regression. That patient is going back. Look at this. Nurses keeping of secrets about nurse-patient relationship. This has been seen on NCLEX so many times. Let me tell you something. 
you get a test question about a patient that says to you, I have a secret to tell you, but I won't tell you unless you promise not to say anything. You wanna know what your response is gonna be? If this secret has to do with your health concerns, I will notify the other members of the healthcare team. You do not promise to keep a secret. Absolutely not. You tell them in advance before they tell you what the secret is. If it has to do with your health, if it's going to affect what we're doing, I will let the rest of the healthcare team or whoever is on the healthcare team that needs to know about it, I will let them know about it. And then they make that decision if they're going to tell you or not. But it's your responsibility to make it clear that you are not going to keep secrets if it's going to affect their health at all. Okay? Values. Values are abstract standards and represent an ideal, either positive or negative. It is your judgment of what's important in life. And everyone's ideals, guys, are going to be different. Examples of values are self-reliance or the importance of self-reliance, honesty, cleanliness, organization, justice, respect, and a healthy lifestyle. Take a look at this, guys. This is Table 8.2, I keep telling you this is where your questions are coming from. All right. Common countertransference reactions. Remember guys, countertransference is the positive or negative feelings of the nurse onto the patient. So what are common countertransference reactions? I'm not gonna go over all of them, but I will go over the ones that are seen most on test. Make sure you guys look at, look at all of it because I don't write your exams, do I? No, I don't. Okay, first one I'm gonna cover is rescue, reaching for unattainable goals. What's the solution? Avoid secret alliances. You tell that patient, I am not going, before you even tell me what you're gonna tell me. If it has to do with your health, it has to do with your progress, I'm not gonna keep it a secret. You see what the solution is? Okay. And um, another solution is developing realistic goals. Otherwise, what's going to happen? That patient's either going to give up or continue just to rely on the nurse. Something else that you cannot do as a nurse, guys, is give advice. When you're communicating with the patient, it has to be in an objective, a non-judgmental manner. Because when you give advice, you're implying that things are right or wrong, and you need the patient to explore their feelings about decisions that they need to make. So you never say, I think you should do this, or you should do that, or I think this is wrong. I think this is right. You're giving advice. We don't do that. That is not therapeutic communication. Next, over-involvement, overstepping your boundaries. What's the solution to that? Avoid self-disclosure. Now, a little bit of self-disclosure is okay because remember, when a patient just meets you, they don't trust you. So, you know, telling the patient a little bit about yourself. So maybe if you're in the maternity unit and you tell your patient, oh, you know, I just gave birth a year ago. You know, you tell a little bit about yourself, but overindulging, telling that patient too much of your personal business, absolutely not. So avoid self-disclosure. Two, avoid calling the patient when off duty. When you are not clocked in, they are not under your care. If you're calling that patient or you even calling, you're off, but you're calling the nurse working that floor to see how that patient's doing, you're starting to blur the lines, okay? Misuse of honesty. An example of that is lying or withholding information that the patient should be privy to. Solution, be clear in your responses. Again, avoid keeping secrets. This is like the third time in two pages I've seen avoid keeping secrets. You think that's going to be a test question? I think so. Oh, you can't see my finger. There it is. Don't say I didn't warn you. Next, anger. When you're angry, you withdraw from the patient or you speak loudly or you use profanity or asking to be taken off the case. Some solutions to this. Determine the origin of the anger. Why are you really upset? Whose needs is not being met here? Yours or the patient's? 
explore the root of the patient's anger if it's a patient that has the, the, the anger. And hopelessness or hopelessness, excuse me, helplessness or hopelessness. Feeling sadness, therapeutic um, solution, maintain therapeutic involvement. Papla described the nurse patient relationship as evolving. That means continually changing, okay? Evolving through three distinct interlocking and overlapping phases. If you're taking psych right now, this is going to be a test question. You better know what this, these are, guys. An additional pre excuse me, an additional pre-orientation phase during which the nurse prepares for orientation phase is included. The four phases are the pre-orientation phase. Again, guys, this is the phase where the nurse prepares for the actual orientation phase. Next is the orientation phase. Introduction, I'm nurse such and such. This is what we're gonna be doing. Working phase, we're act when we're actually working towards the goal and termination phase. Okay, this is the end. How do you expect when you discharge, when you're discharged from here, how do you plan to keep this going? What, are you, what skills or tools are you gonna be using? Do, who are the providers that you're going to be reaching out to for follow-up? Make sure you know these four phases. You're going to see it if your school um, for psych, if they do ATI, it's been seen on ATI and it's been seen on HESI. All right, so pre-orientation phase. Remember, that's when the nurse is actually preparing. The pre-orientation phase begins with preparing for your assignment. Next, the orientation phase. That can last for a few meetings or extend over a longer period. It is the first time that the nurse and the patient meets and is the phase in which the nurse conducts the initial interview. Remember, guys, in um, therapeutic communication, we always want to ask open-ended questions, but there are some situations where we ask open, uh, excuse, excuse me, closed-ended questions. And you see this initial interview, many of those questions are going to be closed-ended questions. Have you ever used illegal substances? Do you have any allergies? Do you have history of diabetes? Whatever it is, they're usually yes, no questions. Those are closed-ended questions, okay? During this orientation phase, you're going to introduce yourself. You're going to establish rapport. Okay. You can nurture rapport by demonstrating genuineness. Don't be fake. People can spot a faker from a mile away. So do not be insincere. Be genuine. Genuineness, empathy, and unconditional positive regard. Being consistent. Offering assistance in problem solving and providing support are also essential aspects of establishing and maintaining rapport. You wanna have a good rapport with the patient. Specifying a contract. A contract emphasizes a patient's participation and responsibility because it shows that the nurse does something with the patient rather than for the patient. Let's talk about this for a second. When it comes to contract, if you have a patient that comes in with depression, and it sounds weird, but I promise you guys it's true, and this is what we do, you have the patient sign a no suicide contract. And that contract states that for the time that they are in this facility, they will not attempt to harm themselves. They will not attempt to kill themselves. And I know what you're thinking, oh, you know, it's a piece of paper, but guess what? The fact that the patient signed their name, for many patients, that's the one thing that keeps them from trying to kill themselves while they're getting uh, treatment, okay? Explaining, con con <clears throat> explaining confidentiality, that's also part of the orientation phase. The patient has a right to know, one, who else will be given the information shared with the nurse? Two, that the information may be shared with specific people, such as the clinical supervisor, the physician, the staff, or other students in conference. They have a right to know that. And it's during the orientation phase where you're doing your initial interview, you're telling them how things are going to work, you're explaining the contract that they're going to have to sign. You also explain their confidentiality rights. I'm going to skip this next page. We'll go back to that in a second. Let's look at the working phase. 
So we did the pre-orientation phase, we did the orientation phase, and now we're in the working phase. This is where the hard work starts, right? Working phase. During the working phase, the nurse and the patient identify and explore areas that are causing problems in the patient's life. What are those problems and how are we gonna to work towards goals for those problems? An important aspect of this working relationship is patient education. Lastly, guys, is the termination phase. The termination phase is the final integral phase of the nurse-patient relationship. You discuss termination during the first interview and again during the working stage at appropriate times. Just like when a patient's admitted to the hospital, discharge planning starts as soon as they're admitted, same thing. The termination phase, you start working on that termination phase as soon as that patient's um, admitted, okay? What did I write up here? Just like you start planning for DC on admission. So for the termination phase, a general question such as, how do you feel about being discharged? You're preparing them for discharge just by asking that question. This may provide the opening necessary for the patient to describe feelings. Now let's jump back to this page, table 8.3. I keep telling you these tables, charts, diagrams, these are where your questions are coming from. Patient behaviors possible nurse reactions and suggested nurse responses. All right, so if the patient threatens suicide, what are you gonna do? The nurse assesses whether the patient has a plan and the lethal lethality of the plan, always. If you suspect a patient suicidal or maybe they threaten it, the first thing you're going to do is, um, if you suspect it, you're gonna ask them directly, are you having thoughts of harming yourself? or killing yourself. But let's say they threaten it, threaten suicide. The first thing you're going to ask them, how do you plan to do it? Why do you ask them that? Because that tells you the lethality of the plan. If we're in Florida and they tell you, I plan on jumping off of Mount Everest, that plan is not as lethal as if they say, I plan on waiting until change of shift and hanging myself in the bathroom with the IV tubing that I snuck under my mattress. You see the difference in lethality, okay? So you're gonna ask them how they plan on killing themselves and you find out if they actually have access to whatever that plan is. If they say, I plan on shooting myself, oh, do you have access to a gun? That tells you the lethality of the plan. Guys, this is on HESI, this is on NCLEX, this is on ATI, you better know this. The nurse tells the patient that this is serious, that the nurse does not want, to har want harm to come to the patient and that this information, what, must be shared with other staff. Do you see a common recurrence here that we don't keep secrets in nursing? You make it clear, I'm telling. Okay, if the patient asks the nurse to keep a secret, <laughs> The nurse cannot make such a promise. Do not ever choose an answer that says, yes, I'll keep your secret. You're gonna get that test question wrong. I, you, here's what you do say. You say, I cannot make that promise. It might be important for me to share with other staff. The patient then decides whether to share the information. You see what I told you from earlier? When a patient tells you that they have a secret, before they reveal their secret, you let them know that there is a chance that you're gonna tell. And you let them decide if they're gonna tell you the secret or not. And when you do this, guys, it helps keep those boundaries from being blurred. Okay, if the patient asks the nurse a personal question. The nurse may or may not answer the patient's query. If the nurse decides to answer a natural question, he or she answers in a word or two, then refocuses back to the patient because it's all about the patient. Sometimes, like I said, guys, very little, you may div divulge just a little bit of information about yourself because you have to establish trust with your patient, but it has to be surfaced and you have to always bring it back to the patient. So if they say, uh, nurse professor D, do you have any kids? I have two. Do you plan on having more children? You see how I brought it back to them? 
I don't say I have two, this is their name, this is the school they go to, oh, they get such a headache, blah, blah, blah. No, I kept it short and sweet and I brought it back to the patient. Look at this, if the patient makes sexual advances, the nurse needs to set clear limits on expected behavior. For example, you can say, I'm not comfortable having you touch or kiss me. This time is for you to focus on your problems and concerns. <coughs> Excuse me. If the patient cries, the nurse should stay with the patient and re reinforce that it's okay to cry. Often it is Often it is at that time that feelings are closest to the surface and can best be identified. A patient starts to cry, that is not the time to turn your back to the patient to go check on your other patients. They start to cry, you don't even have to say a word, just stand right there, sit right there next to the patient. The fact that you stay there without even saying a word, that's called what? Offering self. You're giving that patient value. You're letting them know you're important to me. Even though I have all these other patients to see, I'm going to sit right here until you're ready to talk. If the patient leaves before the session is over, the nurse, where am I? The, wait, here, sorry guys. If the patient leaves before the session's over, some patients are not able to relate for long periods, periods without experiencing an increase in anxiety. Maybe what you guys are working through on that day is just too much for them to handle and they can't handle it, they get anxiety, or maybe they get angry and they walk away. On the other hand, the patient may be testing the nurse. What do you do? You say, I'll wait for you here for 15 minutes until our time is up. Let me tell you what that does. Let's say you guys are working through something and there's 10 minutes left of therapy and they just get up and walk away. When you say to that patient, okay, we have 10 minutes left, I'll wait for you right here in case you want to come back. And you actually sit there and wait that 10 minutes. You're one, letting that patient know that they're important and you want to help them work through the problems. And two, you're letting that patient know that they can't uh, manipulate you. You're not going to run after them. They want to get up and leave. Okay, they got up and left. You're going to sit there until the time is up. Then you're going to go about your business seeing your other patients. So they're going to learn for next time, right? Okay. Let's keep going. During this time, the nurse does not engage in conversation with any other patient or even with the staff. Why? You want to send a signal to that patient that their time is still their time, even though they got up. You're a professional. You're still going to sit there until their time is up. That's why you're doing that. When the time is up, the nurse approaches the patient says that the time is up and restates the day and time the nurse will see the patient again. You're keeping those boundaries from being blurred. You're keeping that patient from manipulating you or thinking that they can manipulating or thinking that they can manipulate you. And you're also letting the patient know that they're important and you wanna help them resolve whatever it is that you guys are working on. You're doing three things by this guys. And lastly, if the patient does not want to talk. At first, the nurse might say something to this effect. It's all right, I would like to spend time with you. We don't have to talk. And then that's when you offer self. You just sit there. Sometimes just sitting there, guys, in that awkward silence, they'll start talking. The nurse might spend short, frequent periods, about five minutes with the patient throughout the day. And you say, our five minutes is up. I'll be back at 10 a.m. and stay with you five more minutes. And by you doing that and actually following through, guys, they start to see that you're consistent. They start to see that you're reliable. They start to see that you're what? Trustworthy, okay? And you guys can read the rest on your own. All right, let's talk about empathy. So empathy, empathy occurs when the helping person attempts to understand the world from the patient's perspective. Essentially, it means temporarily living in the other's life, moving about, moving about in it delicately without making judgments, basically putting your, your, yourself in that person's shoes. 
empathy versus sympathy. You guys have to know this. Empathy is when you put yourself in that patient's shoes, but you still have them do what they need to do to get better. Sympathy is when you feel bad for the patient and because you feel bad for them, you don't have them do what they're supposed to do to feel better. So for example, a patient who just had surgery, after surgery, you're gonna be in pain, right? But we know after surgery, we need that patient walking because we don't want them to get a DVT. We don't want them to get pneumonia, all types of things that can happen when the patient doesn't move about. So because we have empathy, we'll give the patient an analgesic to help with the pain. But sympathy would say, oh, I feel so bad for you. I know you just had surgery. You stay in bed knowing that if that patient stays in bed, all of the ramifications that can happen from that. That is the difference and you have to understand the difference. So let's take a look at this. Sympathetic response versus empathetic response. You guys need to know the difference. So sympathy, sympathy. I feel so bad for you. I know how close you are to your mom. She is such an amazing person. Oh, I'm so sorry. You're feeling bad for them. Empathetic response. This must be devastating for you. Then silence. Why are you being quiet? You're allowing them time to formulate their thoughts and maybe express their feelings if they want to. You don't just keep going. It must seem so unfair. What thoughts and feelings are you having? You're providing them another opportunity to discuss their feelings. You stay with your patient and listen. It's all about them and not how you feel about them. Oh, and that's the end of the chapter. That's it, guys. That's therapeutic relationship in a nutshell. Guys, I hope this video was helpful to you. If there's more, if there are more concepts or topics that you'd like to see me teach on, please sound off in the comments. If there's something you'd like me to do questions on, sound off in the comments about that. Now, guys, don't forget the questions, you know, that's when I get all dolled up for you, right? Those are Sundays, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Lessons, I do those sporadically throughout the week when I have a good 30, 45 minutes to spare. So let's sound off in the comments. Let me know what you thought about this video, what you'd like to see more of. Guys, thank you so much for spending this time listening to what I had to say, listening to the teaching, and you'll see me on the next video.